Uh, we are here to begin a session on the right to freedom of expression and anti-terrorist legislation in Canada. Uh, my name is James Cavallaro, President of the Commission, Rapporteur for Canada. I'm joined by the first Vice President, uh, Francisco Eguiguren. I'm joined by the second uh, Vice President, Margaret May McCauley, by the Dean of the uh, Commission, uh, Commissioner Orozco, uh, Commissioner Paulo Vanucci. Uh, also uh, with us, who will be joining us shortly, is Commissioner Enrique Gil Botero. Uh, the Executive Secretary, Pablo Abrao, uh, is present, as is our Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Edison Lanza. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Delegation from Civil Society for the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, uh, have, we have with us today Duncan Pike in representation thereof, mm -hmm. and for the State of Canada, I understand we have uh, the Ambassador, Ambassador Lowton, uh, Sebastian Seguin, uh, Sandra Loughran and also Jean-Luc Pilon. Uh, so we can offer up to uh, 20 minutes for initial observations. I'll notify at 5, 3, and 1 minute uh, to both sides, and then we will have questions and time for responses with the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Duncan Pike. On behalf of my organization, Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on the critical issue of the human rights implications of the National Security Framework of Canada. CJFE is a national nonprofit organization that works to protect, promote, and defend free expression in Canada and internationally. In light of the ongoing consultations being held by the Government of Canada regarding the national security framework of the country and the constitutional challenge to Canada's most recent anti-terrorist legislation, Bill C-51, or the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015, which is currently before the Ontario Superior Court, brought forward a uh, ch charter challenge brought forth by my organization and Canadian Civil Liberties Association. This hearing is both timely and urgent. The National Security Apparatus of Canada is vast and extends far beyond any one practice or piece of legislation. It cannot possibly be covered adequately in one hearing, and for that reason I will restrict my remarks today as much as is possible to the implications of the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015 or ATA 2015, which became law in June of that year. While my remarks will focus on freedom of expression, I, do, I will also touch on the negative implications for some other rights as well. ATA 2015 is complex omnibus legislation which significantly alters the security laws of Canada. The Act creates expansive new state powers and criminal code offences, some tied to terrorism and others related to broad concepts of national security, without any commensurate increase in legal safeguards. It is our contention, echoing the legal and constitutional scholarly consensus, that the Act is in violation of the Canadian Constitution and the, inter and the inter American human rights system, including the Inter American Democratic Charter and the American Convention on Human Rights. I would like to address six main concerns regarding the Act and the national security system more, more generally, beginning with amendments to the CSIS Act. Part 4 of the ATA 2015 amends the Canadian Security Intelligence Act, or CSIS Act, to provide for a new federal court warrant process that pre-authorizes the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, Canada's intelligence service, to take measures that violate Canadian law and constitutional rights of individuals. This warrant application occurs in camera on an ex parte, ex parte basis with no adversarial challenge, with no prospect of appeal, and with no requirement that the actions taken by CSIS be disclosed after the passage of time to the individual targeted. The Act does not provide for the appointment of a special advocate or an amicus curiae to represent the interests of the individual whose rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or Canadian Charter, are at stake. It constitutes an extraordinary inversion of the traditional role of the judiciary and the principles of fundamental justice by asking the judici judiciary and not Parliament to authorize limits on charter rights as opposed to protecting such rights and presenting their violation. Section 2.1 and 21.1 of the amended CSIS Act violate the liberty and security of person rights guaranteed under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter and Article 9 of the International Covenant on, on Civil and Political Rights in a matter that is not in, in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. They furthermore violate the principles of judicial independence and impartiality and the separation of powers. It destroys the entire purpose of the courts in Canada. In a normal democracy, a judge has oversight over the warrant process in order to ensure an investigation can be conducted without unjustifiably violating charter rights. The ATA 
allows judges to pre-authorize charter violations in secret and without notifying the subject of this violation. This is a bizarre reversal of the purpose of the courts and it is clearly unconstitutional. Furthermore, it puts legitimate investigations in jeopardy as it could easily lead to judges throwing out illegally obtained evidence. Instead of being confined to its role in gathering intelligence, the mandate for which it was created in 1984, under the new laws, CSIS would be authorized to take measures to reduce a perceived, quote, threat to the security of Canada. We take no comfort in the fact that Bill C-51 would constrain CSIS from intentionally causing death or violating sexual integrity. This proposed expansion of powers is especially concerning because the legislation itself does nothing to bolster oversight mechanisms that are already clearly insufficient. For the sake of rights and our national security, it is our contention this provision must be repealed. Next, I will speak about the Secure Air Travel Act enact enactment, which is part two of the ATA 2015. This provision codifies the power of the Minister of Public Safety to deny individuals air travel by placing them on a so-called no-fly list. Section eight of the SATA authorizes the minister to add anyone to the no-fly list on mere suspicion that he or she will, quote, engage or attempt to engage in an act that would threaten transportation security or will, quote, travel by air for the purposes of committing an act of terrorism. Once placed on the no-fly list, it is very difficult for the individual to remove their name from the list. There is no due process, no fundamental justice, and no natural justice under the scheme. The SAC SATA does not require the minister to provide reasons for the individual for their no-fly designation. This act further extends Canada's opaque no-fly list process without providing a meaning meaningful means to appeal for anyone who has been added to the no-fly list. There is no evidence that no-fly lists have ever prevented a terrorist attack, but there is clear evidence that they have a huge societal cost. Many innocent people have been robbed of their ability to travel because they've been added to the list through a secret process with no effective means of appeal. Mahar Arar, to illustrate just one example, is still on a no-fly list. He is still unable to travel because of this faulty process, despite the fact that he has been completely exonerated and has been compensated because of the situation he was in, thanks to Canada's sharing of information with other governments. I want to move on to uh, the most directly relevant to, to the impact on freedom of expression, which is part three, uh, amending the criminal code for the advocating or promoting of terrorism offenses. This section, 83221, provides that every person who by communicating statements knowingly advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general, other than an offense under this section, while knowing that any of those offenses will be committed or being reckless as to whether any of those offenses may be committed as a result of such communication, is guilty of an indictable offense and is liable to imprisonment for a term of not more than five years. The phrase terrorism offenses in general is not defined in the criminal code and is unconstitutionally and dangerously vague and imprecise. The provision does not provide fair notice to citizens of the consequences of their speech or conduct, nor does it sufficiently limit state agents charged with enforcing the provision. As such, the prohibited speech and conduct are neither fixed nor knowable by citizens in advance. The offense is furthermore unconstitutionally overbroad and in violation of Section 2 and Section 7 of the Charter, and from a freedom of expression standpoint is perhaps the most troubling component. So I will go into some of the details regarding our concerns. This provision uh, cr criminalizes constitutionally protected speech, captures an overly broad and imprecise range of communications, including words spoken, written, or recorded electronically, gestures, signs, or any other visible, re uh, visual, visible representations, captures statements made in private, unlike the hate, spe hate speech provision under section 3192 of the criminal code, captures an overly vague, broad, and imprecise range of terrorism offenses in general, which criminalizes speech and conduct far and beyond the 14 existing terrorism offenses. It captures persons who have not made their criminalized statements, but who have merely aided or assisted the person making the criminalized statement. For example, this, pr this could include journalists who publish statements by others that advocate or promote terrorism while commenting on them. It requires only a low threshold of knowingly and recklessly, as opposed to willfully advocating or promoting terrorism. does not require an actual terrorist purpose, unlike other terrorism offenses under the criminal code. Requires only a low threshold of probability, a possibility, i.e. may, that the accused communications result in, in the commission of a terrorist offense, 
as opposed to requiring the demonstration of a probability that it will result in the commission of a terrorism offense. Requires only the low threshold of recklessness as opposed to knowledge that a terrorism offense may be committed as a result of the communication. And it does not include reasonable statutory defenses that would remove the offense's reach um, conduct that a free society could not reasonably penalize. The provision has a chilling effect on freedom of expression and association, even if no prosecution is ever brought. Persons will remain silent rather than risk the perils of prosecution, especially since the offense can reach those who do not have a terrorist purpose and there is no statutory defense. Moreover, because it is a new terrorism offense and terrorism offenses are sp subject to especially broad wiretap authorizations, it will subject more people to more surveillance for their speech and not their physical conduct. This too will inhibit expression in an unconstitutional and dangerous manner. New sections of the criminal code also allow for judicial orders to seize and delete, quote, terrorist propaganda, defined as any writing, sign, visible representation, or audio recording that advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general, other than offense of under section 83221. As with the previous section, the phrase terrorism offenses in general is not defined in the criminal code and is both dangerously vague and overbroad. Any legislation establishing criminal offenses must be in line with the principle of legality as set out in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The principle of legality requires that the law must classify and describe crimes in precise and unambiguous language that narrowly defines the punishable offense. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while countering terrorism has noted that this requires that the imposition of criminal liability be limited to clear and precise provisions so as to respect the principle of certainty of the law and ensure that it is not subject to interpretation, which would unduly broaden the scope of the, of the prescribed conduct. Overly, brag, o overly vague or broad definitions of terrorism would not meet this requirement and may be used by states as a means to cover peaceful acts, to discriminate against per particular individuals or groups, or to limit any sort of political opposition. This is not something we necessarily expect from the Canadian government, but it's something we've seen in other countries, certainly ongoing in Turkey right now, where any sort of uh, opposition to the current regime or independent media is being described as terrorism, it's being described as supporting terrorism, promoting terrorism, and individuals are being targeted on that basis. This new offense does not contain any of the defenses that are found in other areas where expression is criminalized, such as the private conversation, public interest or educational defenses that are provided for offense dealing with, for example, child pornography or hate propaganda. Freedom of expression includes not only the right to speak, write and express oneself, but also the right of individuals in Canada to hear, to read and to listen. The censorship provisions have a chilling effect on freedom of expression and will result in censorship and the seizure or deletion of content that may pose no genuine threat to Canada's safety. I want to move on to another component, the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act, or CISA. CISA authorizes information sharing between Government of Canada institutions on any, quote, activity that undermines the security of Canada. This term is defined in Section 2 of CISA, but in a matter, again, that is both vast and uncertain. The information subject to sharing under the new Act undermines the right to life, liberty, and security of the person because the conduct the concept of activity that undermines the security of Canada is unconstitutionally vague. That vagueness may be deployed entirely by the executive branch of government without any serious prospect of anyone outside of that branch will know how it is being applied. This is because a person will not know that information about or, or related to them has been shared and will have no opportunity to bring a court proceeding in which the act might be interpreted. Even assuming an individual has sufficient knowledge of government actions to bring a complaint, no specialized national security re review body has jurisdiction to review the vast majority of the agencies that the Act empowers to share information. In sum, the Act accords the executive branch of government sweeping and unchecked powers to construe a vague definition of activity that undermines the security of Canada in secret. The scope of information sharing that the CISA authorizes as a security matter will chill expression and association rights guaranteed by Section 2 of the Charter not least because no, no person is able to determine or challenge in a meaningful way how their activities and conduct have been or might be construed by the state as, quote, undermining the security of Canada. They will not know how information pertaining to their activities and conduct might be then shared and used. 
the prospects of invasive state archiving and information sharing about an individual's activities under the overbroad and vague concept of the threat to security of Canada will deter legitimate expression and association. This concern is amplified by the fact that most information sharing activity conducted under the Act will take place in secret and further is subject to insufficient review. No specialized national security review body reviews the vast majority of agencies that the Act empowers to share this information. As such, they do not know what happens when information is shared beyond their respective agencies. The Privacy Commission, Commissioner has, of Canada has an all of government remit but is not equipped for reviewing national security information sharing. For all of these reasons, individuals will have no means by which to become aware of how or whether the information about their, about their activities is being shared, which in turn deprives them of both recourse and remedy in the information in the event that information exempted from the scope of the Act is illegally shared. Without strong privacy safeguards, it becomes far more difficult, if not impossible, for people to exercise their human right to freedom of expression. There are real, tangible harms that are demonstrated to occur when a society and its citizens are subjected to the kind of far-reaching, suspicionless surveillance and information sharing that the government is currently directing at Canadians. This is not an abstract or theoretical concern. It is an established fact, backed by a large body of scientific research, that when people believe they're being watched, their behavior changes in significant ways. <clears throat> I want to speak briefly about the, um, the operations of the Communications Security Establishment, CSE, which is Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency. CSE operates an expansive metadata surveillance program operating under a ministerial directive that allows it to collect and analyze the metadata that is produced by Canadians using mobile phones or accessing the internet. CSE is permitted to read Canadians' emails and text messages and listen to Canadians' phone calls whenever they communicate with a person outside of Canada. There is no court or committee that monitors the CSE's interpretation of these private communications and metadata information, and there is no judicial oversight of its sweeping powers. CSE's operations are shrouded in secrecy. We have learned that CSE exploited vulnerabilities in a mobile web browser used by 500 million people in order to monitor uh, information related to a user's identities, uh, communication activities, and location data. Rather than the alert the company and users to this breach in security, they exploited it, failing to safeguard the security of over 500 million mobile users. Broad-scale digital surveillance has never been proven to stop an imminent attack anywhere in the world, and the database, databases that these practices produce are dangerously, dangerously vulnerable to hacking by hostile parties, whether state or non-state actors. Before I conclude, uh, I want to cite as well the particular threat to the civil rights of Canadian Muslims. <clears throat> I will quote from a report by our colleagues at the National Council of Canadian Muslims, a nonprofit grassroots organization that acts as one of the leading voices for Muslim civic, civic engagement in Canada. In recent years, Muslims around the world have been subjected to heightened suspicion. Canadian Muslims are no exception and are adversely impacted by the intensification of national security measures. Uh, the ATA 2015 has the real potential to chill speech, worship, and associations where Canadian Muslims may fear engaging in lawful activity out of a fear of suspicion, contrary to expressive freedoms and equality rights under the Canadian Charter. Not only is this problematic from a prima facie legal perspective, it is also counterproductive in that those like religious scholars who, be, who may be most effective in demystifying and deconstructing the simplistic narratives of violent extremists may be scared into silence for fear of being implicated by association. Any law that purports to strengthen national security should take into account the potential impact on the Canadian Muslim community and other vulnerable minorities. Sound national security policy is designed for the benefit of all Canadians and should not make any group of Canadians more insecure or the subject of stereotyping, stereotyping stigma and over-policing. <clears throat> CJFE, along with our partners across civil society in Canada, believes that the ATA 2015 is unnecessary and are calling for its full repeal by the Liberal government. Its purported, purported benefit of ensuring the safety of Canadians is unproven, while its features, such as no-fly lists and secret information sharing, are proven to decrease personal security for some Canadians. The Act invites breaches of, cons of constitutional rights and freedoms by creating vague and redundant powers, such as amendments to the Criminal Code, which creates an offence of knowingly advocating or promoting the commission of terrorism in general. 
This vague and overbroad and almost certain to be applied in this is vague and overbroad and almost certainly to be applied in an unconstitutional manner. Moreover, there are existing provisions in the criminal code that are designed to prevent and punish acts of terrorism, including facilitating, participating in, instructing, harboring, and financing terrorism. We thank you for the opportunity, or I thank you for the opportunity to bring this case before the Commission. Although many of the issues I've spoken about today may not appear to impact freedom of expression directly, the broadness of the legislation, the lack of oversight, and the potential for abuse means that these new laws could easily be used to target political enemies of the government, journalists uncovering difficult truths, or citizens exercising their constitutional right to, freak, to speak freely, to dissent, and to protest. History teaches us that genuine security can only be maintained through the promotion and protection of human rights. Human rights must be at the heart of Canada's national security strategy. To ensure the effectiveness of this approach, national security proposals should be carefully examined, tested for uh, constitutionality, and regularly reviewed to assess their impact upon human rights standards and obligations. Canada's current national security regime, including the ATA 2015, was not built upon these principles and as a consequence is, we believe, in violation of Canada's constitution, the Inter-American Democratic Charter, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Thank you. Many thanks for the information. Uh, Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, commissioners and uh, civil society and other representatives here today. There, there are no numbers in my presentation now, so we're safe this time. <laughs> I'll be careful. Um, I would like to thank the uh, civil society organizations represented here, particularly the Canadian Journalists for Freedom of Expression, for raising their concerns about the human rights implications of the national security framework of Canada. Canada is proud of its human rights record, and we continue to build on our successes and to address and learn from challenges. Canada's law enforcement and national security agencies are firmly committed to ensuring the safety and security of Canada and Canadians within a context of respect for human rights. The frameworks we have in place for crime prevention, law enforcement, counterterrorism, and border protection have rigorous systems of checks and balances that meet or exceed both domestic and international human rights commitments. Specifically, all relevant activities of government officials are subject to Canadian and applicable international law and are also subject to objective oversight and review processes and mechanisms. Complaints mechanisms are in place to help ensure that allegations of wrongdoing are investigated and redress is available for complaints that are upheld. This is within the larger accountability framework that Canada's judicial system provides. We have an independent and impartial judiciary and many non-judicial mechanisms such as parliamentary committees, public inquiries and independent civil police review mechanisms and at all levels of government. Human rights are protected and promoted in a number of key pieces of Canadian legislation. Most fundamentally, rights are guaranteed at the constitutional level in Canada by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter includes, among other things, robust protection for the freedom of expression and other fundamental freedoms. The Charter also protects against deprivation of life, liberty and security of the person pursuant to overly broad or vague laws and guarantees procedural fairness when life, liberty, or security of the person is at stake. Privacy rights are also constitutionally protected under Section 8 of the Charter, which encompasses informational privacy and which applies to the sharing of private information between government officials. In the event of a government action that unjustifiably violates the Charter, courts can order an appropriate and just remedy, including an injunction or other order of compensatory damages. Additional protections for privacy rights is provided by the Federal Privacy Act, which sets out a code of fair practices for the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information by federal government institutions. The Privacy Commissioner has broad powers to investigate complaints and to issue reports of findings and non-binding recommendations. In the area of national security, today's threats are more complex and diverse than ever before. Global violent extremist groups, including Daesh and its affiliates, pose serious threats to Canada and to our allies. The 2015 Anti-Terrorism Act enacted the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act and the Secure Air Travel Act, amended the Criminal Code and the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and made consequential amendments to other acts. When the act, previously known as Bill C-51, was before Parliament in 2015, 
many Canadians expressed concern about how the proposed legislation would appropriately safeguard both security and rights. This concern is important in the national security context where charter rights and freedoms regularly come into play. I will explain the changes brought about by the Anti-Terrorism Act in 2015 and present the measures the government has launched to address these public concerns. The Anti-Terrorism Act of 2015 enacted the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act, CISA, which was referred to previously, to better facilitate national security information sharing. The CISA creates an explicit disclosure authority which provides greater certainty about when institutions can share information for national security reasons. The CISA authorizes all federal institutions to disclose information, including information about individuals, related to, and I quote, activities that undermine the security of Canada, end quote. Repeat quote, activity that undermines the security of Canada, quote, is defined as any activity that undermines the sovereignty, security, or territorial integrity of Canada, or the lives and the security of the people of Canada, end quote, from Section 2. This concept covers a broad range of national security-related activities and is intended to provide flexibility to accommodate new forms of threats that may arise. The CISA includes examples of these activities that may be covered by this context, concept. Pardon me. The definition of activities that undermine the security of Canada only includes activities that have an impact on national security. Some Canadians expressed concern during the parliamentary examination of the bill that became the ATA that their right to protest may be impacted by the CISCA. The CISA was amended to make it clear that all forms of advocacy, protest, dissent, and artistic expression do not fall within the definition of activities that undermine the security of Canada. As a result, information about these activities cannot be disclosed under CISA. The CISA cannot be used to bypass other laws prohibiting or limiting disclosure. If another law restricts use or sharing of information, these continue to apply and must be respected. Information sharing under CISA may be reviewed uh, like other instances of government information sharing. In particular, the Privacy Act allows the Privacy Commissioner of Canada to review institutions' handling of personal information and to hold institutions accountable by releasing public reports. Some institutions, including the RCMP, CSIS, and the CSE, also have specific bodies that review their work, including information sharing practices that are part of this work. The government provides aviation security in part by preventing individuals who have the intent or capability to harm passengers and aircraft from boarding. The ATA 2015 enacted the Secure Air Travel Act, the SATA, under the SATA, the Minister for Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, or his or her delegate, has the authority to establish a list of individuals, called the SATA list, under the Passenger Protection Program. In order to be listed, the minister or a delegated official must have reasonable grounds to suspect that an individual will, one, pose a threat to transportation security, or two, may travel by air to commit certain terrorism offenses. Once an individual is listed, the minister or his or her delegate can direct an air carrier to take an appropriate operational response when he or she attempts to board an aircraft, which may include additional screening or being denied boarding. An individual who has been denied boarding will receive written notification that they have been denied boarding under SATA and will be informed of their entitlement to recourse. They can then apply in writing for recourse to the Passenger Protect Inquiries Office within 60 days of being denied boarding. The application seeks to have the individual's name removed from the SATA list. The applicant receives an unclassified summary of the information used to support the listing and has an opportunity to respond. The minister would review the application and decide whether there are still reasonable grounds to maintain the applicant on the SATA list. Even though most decisions made under the PPP rely on sensitive information, the judge hearing the appeal can see all information relevant to the government's decision. To protect against disclosures of sensitive information, the applicant sees a summary of the relevant sensitive information. The judge may appoint an amicus curiae to, to assist the court with any aspect of the proceeding where the applicant cannot be present. 
In 2015, the change to the criminal code makes it a criminal offense for a person by, communica by communicating statements to knowingly advocate or promote the commission of terrorism offenses in general. To commit the offense, the person must know that any of those offenses will be committed or be reckless as to whether any of those offenses may be committed as a result of such communication. The definition of terrorism offense in the criminal code includes a broad range of conduct from violence against people and destruction of property to providing financial and material support and recruitment. Before the 2015 change to the criminal code, the scope of the offense of counseling was unclear. There was some uncertainty about whether it constituted counseling if a person actively encourages committing terrorism offenses but was not specific about the offenses or the type of offenses, for example, whether terrorism bombing or terrorist financing. There was also uncertainty about what the penalty would be. This new offense makes it clear that such conduct is criminal. The new offense is modeled on the existing law of counseling. It extends the concept of counseling to cases where no specific terrorism offense is being counseled, but where it is evident nonetheless that terrorism offenses are being counseled. The, the offense is not an attempt to criminalize glorification of terrorism or praise of terrorism. The offense prohibits active encouragement to commit terrorism offenses, not mere expressions of opinion about the acceptability of terrorism. The warrant provisions for taking down such content are similar to the warrant of seizure provisions for child pornography and voyeuristic material and were specifically modeled on those that relate to hate propaganda. To ensure appropriate oversight, the prior consent of the appropriate Attorney General is needed to begin proceedings in respect of terrorism offenses. The Anti-Terrorism Act amended the CSIS Act to authorize CSIS to reduce threats to the security of Canada. CSIS can now do more than share information. It can also take direct action against threats to reduce the danger they pose. This threat reduction mandate does not give it law enforcement powers. CSIS must obtain a warrant from federal court before it can take threat reduction measures that would affect rights protected under the Charter. The Charter recognizes that rights and freedoms are not absolute and that at times they may justifiably be limited. A warrant shows that the court has determined in advance that the proposed threat reduction measures are reasonable and proportional under the circumstances. The Security Intelligence Review Committee, the CERC, is mandated to review all CSIS operational activity, which includes all threat disruption activity, to ensure that they respect Canadian law and that they represent a reasonable and necessary exercise of CSIS powers. The Anti-Terrorism Act also requires that CERC regularly examine threat disruption activity and summarizes its findings in an annual report which is tabled in Parliament. The last part of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2015 amended Division 9 of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act regarding the disclosure of classified information in security certificate cases. Under the amendments, the government may ask the judge for an exemption from providing some classified information to the special advocate as part of the disclosure of relevant information in closed proceedings. The judge may grant this exemption only if satisfied that the exempted information would not enable the person to be reasonably informed of the government's case. The judge is permitted to consult with the special advocates about the information before making this decision. As part of the ongoing national security consultations, the government is considering how to balance protecting national security information and legal proceedings while still ensuring that we respect the principles of fundamental justice. On September 8th of 2016, the Government of Canada launched national security consultations to seek public input to ensure the national security framework fulfills two essential imperatives to effectively keep Canadians safe, while at the same time safeguarding values, rights, and freedoms. The consultations are anchored in Our Security, Our Rights, the National Security Green Paper of 2016, which is a detailed background document, and together the two provide an overview of 10 key national security issues, including countering radicalization to violence, accountability, and the 2015 Anti-Terrorism Act. The green paper and the backgrounders have been provided as an annex to the material Canada has provided. The green paper and the consultations also reflect the government's commitment to re-examine the Anti-Terrorism Act, <coughs> the former BC51, 
to guarantee that all Canadian security and intelligence services warrants comply with the Charter, to ensure that Canadians are not limited from legitimate protest and advocacy, to enhance the redress processes related to the Passenger Protect Program and address the issue of false positive matches to the list, to narrow overly broad definitions such as defining terrorist propaganda more clearly, and to require a statutory review of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2015 after three years. The input collected under this initiative will help to inform the development of Canada's national security policies, laws and programs to ensure the effectiveness of tools available to law enforcement and security agencies while safeguarding our rights and freedoms. The Communications Security Establishment, the CSE, is one of Canada's key security intelligence organizations. Its mandate and authorities focus on three things. Collecting foreign signals intelligence in support of the Government of Canada's priorities related to international affairs, defence and security. Helping to protect the electronic information and information infrastructures of importance to the Government of Canada. And providing technical and operational assistance to federal law enforcement and security organisations in their legally organised activities. It's important to note that while carrying out the first two elements of its mandate, foreign signals intelligence and the protection of information infrastructures, CSE is strictly prohibited from targeting Canadians anywhere in the world or any person in Canada. CSE is also prohibited from asking Canadian allies to do anything on CSE's behalf that is not legal for CSE to do. Given the complex and global nature of modern telecommunications, CSE may, when targeting foreign entities outside of Canada, incidentally intercept the private communications of Canadians. Under the National Defence Act, the Minister of National Defence may authorize foreign intelligence collection activities that could risk such interception. If a private communication is incidentally intercepted by CSE, it must and does take steps, steps to protect the privacy of that information. CSE's activities are continuously reviewed by an external and independent review body, the Office of the CSE Commissioner. CSE is also subject to external review by other parliamentary agents such as the Auditor General, the Privacy Commissioner, the Information Commissioner and Commissions of Inquiry. Finally, I would like to say a word or two about metadata. CSE's collection and analysis of metadata is authorized under the National Defense Act. CSE recognizes that metadata may contain information that has a privacy interest and takes strict measures to protect the privacy of Canadians and persons in Canada. CSE does not use this data to identify any individual Canadian or person in Canada. In all of its activities, CSE is required by law to protect the privacy of Canadians and comply with other applicable Canadian laws including the Privacy Act, the Criminal Code and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Canada is strengthening its system of accountability for national security by creating a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliament. The committee would act with full independence from government in deciding which matters to review and in reporting its findings and recommendations. The establishment of the NCCOP is only the first step in the process of ensuring that Canada's system for national security accountability is robust and comprehensive. For that reason, the government is studying a number of additional ways in which the system for national security accountability could be improved. The results of the national security consultation will help inform the government's next steps. In conclusion, Canada will continue to ensure that adequate safeguards are in place to protect Canadians' rights under the Charter, the Privacy Act and international human rights laws by strengthening protection, review and accountability of all its existing and future legislations and policies. Canada takes its international human rights obligations seriously and is committed to maintaining a constructive dialogue with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is vital in a strong and effective international human rights system. We also welcome all opportunities to engage with Canadians, as which we recognize as efforts to strengthen our international uh, and national security frameworks. We thank you very much for your presence here today, and we thank the Commissioners for their time. Many thanks, Madam Ambassador. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Pike. Uh, let me uh, open the floor uh, to my colleagues. Uh, we'll do this uh, generally, starting with uh, Commissioner A. E. Wooden. No. Uh, Commissioner McCauley. <coughs> no, I was. Sorry, thank you. I was being lazy. <laughs>
I will leave. I will leave the question for the expert. Uh, Commissioner uh, Orozco, the commission. Sí, pero, si le, ofre, le, le ofrezco a, a él la palabra, pero este, alguien antes, este, un, no, este, yo tengo unas preguntas, este, o, o sea, como redactor para Canadá, Canadá, uh, y sí, 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 pero eh, me comunico con él, este, y después, este, con certeza habrá este, espacio para completar. Entonces yo hago algunas preguntas y ahí después este, le paso a, al señor este, redactor especial. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, a, a, a few of the concerns, and many of these were raised in uh, some detail by Mr. Pike, and you've responded. But uh, let me start with the judicial warrant process that, in fact, constitutes a pre authorization for advocating terrorism. And, uh, I admit that I share the concern of the mens rea of recklessness, that knowledge with a higher standard is largely irrelevant. If the lowest, lower standard is recklessness, then that's the basis uh, under which someone could be uh, held to account. Uh, and I'm wondering how you see that as consistent with international human rights norms. Um, and, and second, uh, the concerns about the no-fly list and the operation and the procedures. Uh, one concern I have is about removing people from uh, the no-fly list. And there, uh, the example of uh, Mahar Arar, who is still on the no-fly list, again, it's a single case, but it does suggest at least that the system is not as efficient as it could or should be when the wrong that has been done to Mr. Arar has been recognized by the relevant Canadian authorities. Uh, and then, uh, related to Mr. Orr's case is a concern that I have about uh, information sharing. Uh, and I don't know the extent of information sharing, but if you look at the case of Mr. Orr, uh, the possibilities raised when information is shared with a state that, sh shall we say, doesn't have the same guarantees and protections against torture uh, that Canadians enjoy, enjoy uh, what happens when Canada shares information, even if Canada doesn't request, please commit unlawful, heinous acts against this person. But if it provides information to a state, and there are many, that cannot be trusted to respect the physical integrity of an individual, uh, how is that consistent uh, with Canada's obligations under inter-American law, but also under the Convention Against Torture? So those are three questions I have. I'm sure the Special Rapporteur uh, has more. Uh, y le paso la palabra. Gracias, Presidente, y también eh, agradecer la frondosa información aportada por tanto este, el Centro para la Protección de Libertad de Expresión de, de Canadá como por parte de la representación del Estado. Eh, primero, un pequeño comentario general, eh, retomando algo que los solicitantes de la audiencia mencionaban, respecto a la, la cantidad de amenazas que enfrentan eh, los periodistas alrededor del mundo en la actualidad. Algunas organizaciones la, la, han, la han caracterizado como sin precedentes en cuanto al autoritarismo que enfrentan de parte de algunos gobiernos, obviamente la violencia y también la aplicación de, de leyes represivas. Y por lo tanto, eh, por supuesto que reconocemos la trayectoria y la tradición de respeto a las libertades fundamentales de, del Estado canadiense, pero también de algún modo creo que la, la comunidad internacional espera eh, de Canadá un líder en, en este momento eh, tal vez crítico que vive, que vive el mundo. Eh, en, en ese sentido, eh, bueno, me, 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 me complace escuchar que el actual gobierno está dispuesto a revisar algunos de los aspectos y preocupaciones que, que aquí se han levantado. ¿no? Este, en ese sentido, eh, ustedes han aportado mucha información, eh, pero no es novedad, en general, en realidad, los relatores para la libertad de expresión en los últimos, yo diría, 10 años, hemos eh, pronunciado tal vez tres declaraciones conjuntas relativas a cómo enfrentar las situaciones de terrorismo y extremismo que lamentablemente este, vive el mundo. Y una de las cuestiones es la, la de la criminalización de expresiones que, eh, digamos, buscan eh, detectar aquellas expresiones que incitan a 
eh, la comisión de actos terroristas. Eh, pero muchas veces la descripción que hacen las leyes son, no son lo suficientemente estrictas, eh, tal vez son eh, muchas veces vagas y ambiguas, y eso ha llevado a ejemplos, usted me nombraba el caso de Turquía, también podemos este, eh, nombrar casos aquí en la región, donde, voy muy rápido, también podemos mencionar casos en la región, la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos ha pronunciado sentencias en relación, por ejemplo, a la aplicación de la ley antiterrorista en Chile, donde justamente han eh, sido utilizadas estas, estas figuras penales para este, alcanzar a la protesta de pueblos indígenas o a expresiones, digamos, de columnistas o, o periodistas. Eh, no lo voy a leer aquí, pero justamente lo que, lo que digamos, recomienda el derecho internacional es este, eh, restringir eh, la, la criminalización a los casos donde haya incitación intencional al terrorismo. Y tal vez eh, la pregunta es si en este marco del reconocimiento de que se podría revisar esta, esta expresión, se puede abrir un diálogo con justamente las, las organizaciones de defensa de la libertad de expresión, el gobierno, el parlamento, y también desde ya ponemos a disposición la... la eh, asistencia técnica de, de la Relatoría y de la Comisión, si hay espacio para este, para este diálogo, me parece bien importante. Eh, en segundo lugar, se mencionó eh, eh, lo que tiene que ver con las facultades este, especiales de, de vigilancia que, que esta nueva autoridad que se ha creado eh, digamos, tiene para re, eh, compartir información y realizar eh, vigilancia y cómo esto podría afectar justamente la privacidad de la, del, y la reserva de las fuentes periodísticas o la información que eh, muchos eh, periodistas, activistas, eh, digamos, eh, tienen o hacen o circulan a través de, de, sus, eh, de sus cuentas de correo electrónico, de sus teléfonos, etc. Eh, la pregunta concreta es si existe algún tipo de información de posibles afectaciones a eh, la reserva de las fuentes periodísticas eh, por la aplicación de estas, de estas normas eh, y tenemos conocimiento, hemos también solicitado información al Estado sobre algún caso donde jueces han solicitado la revelación de información eh, producto eh, digamos del ejercicio del periodismo. Eh, este caso de, de, period, de periodista de, de, del sitio Vice es el más conocido. Entonces quería también saber cómo el Poder Judicial está protegiendo digamos, las fuentes periodísticas en este, en este sentido. Y para finalizar, muy, muy corto, eh, la, la lista de eh, pasajeros que no podrían, o la lista de ciudadanos que no podrían justamente utilizar eh, el transporte aéreo, eh, si tenemos eh, al menos estadísticas públicas sobre la cantidad de personas a, afectadas y las razones eh, innominadas sobre la, las cuales se aplicó esta, esta lista. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señor relator especial. Eh, podemos ofrecer a las dos partes hasta cinco minutos para poder responder a, lo, a las a preguntas levantadas, pero le, les invito, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me invite you both to continue to uh, inform us in writing. These are topics that are of interest to the commission, they're of interest to the special rapporteur, Uh, so what you are not able to say in these five minutes on this very complex and challenging topic, uh, please do continue to maintain the Commission informed. Uh, let me offer you the floor for five minutes, Mr. Pike. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, just, just to briefly respond to, to some of those points. Um, certainly uh, the, the uh, concerns raised um, regarding the, uh, the, the Advocating Commission of Terrorism Offenses in general, um, it, certainly, it certainly does fall short of, of international legal expectations, I think, and that's something, I'm, I'm not, I should say I'm not a legal scholar, I'm, I'm relying on the work of, of people who work, who work with us and, and um, work on behalf of our organization. But um, something we've, we've heard again and again is that uh, journalists who are simply reporting on, on statements made by, uh, made by uh, accused terrorists, um, and, and certainly the, um, the Vice News case that you raised, I think, is very important in this respect. But he, um, 
simply quoting a terrorist, uh, someone who's speaking out uh, and, and passing along their message strictly from a, from a public interest perspective, this, this is something that we, you want societies to know. You, they need to know what, um, what violent extremist groups, what terrorist groups are saying and passing along this information strictly from a journalistic standpoint or even say um, if, you're, if you're just a, an interested, interested party and you're a concerned citizen and you're sharing it on your Facebook wall saying, even saying this, this is terrible, this is horrible, I condemn this. That, that use and that, um, that form of expression isn't protected under, under, as written according to, the, to, our, to our legal analysis. That could put you under the crosshairs of this. I mean, you could say that that's, that's certainly not what was intended to, to the sort of speech that was intended to criminalize, but um, that doesn't provide much, much comfort. It should be written in such a way, in such a precise way that it protects this kind of speech. Um, um, it was said that the, the communication security establishment may not target Canadians. Um, what we've found in practice is that the definition of target has been um, construed extremely uh, liberally by the communication security establishment. Um, if, if there was one case revealed by, um, by documents uh, re revealed by Edward Snowden, which is that um, there was a program at, uh, at uh, the airport in, uh, in the city of Toronto, uh, where I'm from, that monitored the comings and goings of um, users logging into the internet through the airport Wi-Fi. And this was uh, not targeting Canadians, but it was done in a Canadian airport, uh, looking at Canadians, um, Canadians' uh, use of the, of, the, of the internet. And it was d determined that this is somehow not targeting it through some um, very creative legal and, uh, and linguistic uh, maneuvers. Um, we know that CSIS, in fact, did share metadata improperly over, over a very long time period with, with people in the United States. Um, and has now, this has been reviewed, this is being reviewed and, and they had to stop this practice um, as a result and this is on hold. Um, you raised the, uh, the case of, uh, of, ben, of Ben Maku in, in, the, in of Vice News in, in Canada. Um, this is, um, um, for those who don't know, this is um, Ben Maku's reporter for Vice News who was um, communicating with um, an accused terrorist uh, fighting with, with uh, Islamic State. Um, and they were chatting over over uh, so Kick Messenger app, and uh, uh, Mr. Maku published stories based on this, and it included statements. Uh, he had there was an interview that they were able to to schedule with with this accused fighter, um, originally from Calgary. I should say he's a, he's a Canadian citizen. Um, and as a result of this reporting, um, the RCMP uh, uh, served a production order to to Mr. Maku, forcing him to hand over his private communications with. Um, with this source, and I should say it's not not a not an anonymous source. This, this person wanted to be revealed to the world, but his private communications with this uh, with Mr. Maku, uh, the chat logs from and screenshots from from this um, communications platform were being forced to hand hand this over. And this is something um, we find extremely troubling. It turns the um, turns the investigative function of the press into uh, into an arm of the police, um, and it I think it serves uh, incredibly chilling uh, on on the use of sources and the um, one of the foundational principles of freedom of expression, which is the protection of sources. And uh, CJFE has joined in a coalition uh, and um, to intervene in this case, to fight this, uh, to force him to hand over these notes. And it's something, I think, as part of a pattern, a very disturbing pattern for press freedom in Canada, in which we've seen, um, which you've probably heard about, including um, um, reporters uh, in Quebec being spied on by, by police as well. So. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pike. Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and uh, thank you for all of your comments and reactions, and thank you in particular to the Special Rapporteur. I am certainly no expert in this very detailed and sophisticated area. We have taken very careful notes, and we will provide specific reaction to the issues that we raise, or that you've raised. I would like to take one minute, though, to say how very important this exercise is. Um, Canada has put in place a series of measures. Um, we have reviewed the security uh, and intelligence framework, and we have done it in consultation with Canadians, but that is not a process that, that ends. It is this kind of exchange. It's engagement with organizations like the Canadian Federation for uh, Journalistic Freedom and Freedom of Expression that is part of an ongoing process and is the cornerstone of good governance. 
uh, it's extremely important to the Canadian government and we very much value the reaction of Canadian citizens and of organizations who help to find uh, the loopholes, the impacts, uh, the ways these, these things work in a very quickly evolving environment. Um, I think there are a great many ways that we live now that are different than the way we lived 10 years ago. The way we collect information, the way we exchange information, the way we engage with each other that could not have been foreseen 10 years ago. And I think we're learning as we go. And it's partnerships with organizations that can defend the interests and the rights of Canadians in communication with a government who seeks to support their security and protect their rights and freedoms. Finding that balance is a moving target, but it's a very important goal of the Government of Canada. So I would like to thank the Commission for providing this space, and I would like to thank uh, not only the organization that is the petitioner today, but other Canadian organizations that continue to work with the Government of Canada to find the balance, to defend the rights of Canadians, to find those points where the intention, a well-intentioned government and, and legal framework may cross the line. Um, we can't do that alone, and it's extremely important that this conversation with civil society continues, and I thank the Commission for providing the space and the support that they do. Uh, so again, we will get back to you with specific answers to the questions and uh, no Oop, cut off. Thank you. Many thanks, Madam Ambassador. Uh, thanks uh, to Mr. Pike and the organization you represent for raising these issues. Thank you for the information provided. Uh, uh, our thanks as well for the information that is to be provided, uh, as well as the interest uh, expressed by uh, Her Excellency the Ambassador to continue a dialogue and in that regard. Uh, to the extent that uh, the Commission and our Special Rapporteur ship uh, can be uh, of assistance in that dialogue with standards and, uh, and a forum for discussion, we're, we're happy to provide uh, that space. With that, uh, uh, our thanks and we conclude the session.